at Siri because I'm going to record it. I'm recording it to the crowd. <laughs> the, the die has been cast now. Yes, yeah, right. Okay, so anyways, well, welcome. We have we have some guests here, um, and I gave uh, a little record. Uh, make notes of any errors I have, please. Okay, sure. One person designated for that. Uh, while you're talking, you want that done? Yeah. Okay. You can use notes or something if anyone sees anything. If just one person collect them all and then send them to me, please. Are you talking about errors in your presentation? Yes, please. Okay. And you want them, us to put them in the notes, correct? I'd like one person to collect the notes. Anyone can post something to the notes, but then collect them in the notes and send them to me, please. I don't want to have to. I don't chat. Yes, yeah. I don't want to have to worry about that while I'm giving this presentation. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll do that. That sounds fine. I um, need to point. I should point out that um, I'm fairly sick with two different kinds of cancer. One very major, and I might have to take a break to just deal with it. Okay. No problem there. That's for sure. Okay. I'm gonna. So, uh, anyways. So, welcome everyone. Um, and earlier, earlier this where we where we where we were in the uh, uh, before the meeting, we had a little um, we had some people in, in the in the uh, Zoom. We were talking about different things, and I mentioned also some of the stuff about what the Alameda Photograph Society um, offers. If you're interested, we you know we do all we do all, all of our meetings remotely, uh, at least the meetings for the club, and anybody can join any wherever you are, wherever you in the world, you're welcome. And we have a website. You can search for Alameda Photographic Society, and you'll find our website. There's a bunch of information there for how to join. And or if you just want, if you know, if, if you don't want to submit images to the compete to compete, you can join anytime. You can, you can. Uh, we'll we'll give you the 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 URL for the Zoom, and you can. You're definitely welcome to uh, participate and listen and watch and and discuss. Um, it's it's good. It's good for us, and it's good for everyone who who uh, who joins. So that being said, so. Uh, Greg is, uh, he's quite the accomplished photographer. Actually, I get a newsletter from Greg. Um, Greg, I was wondering if you want to actually put that in the chat, uh, maybe a, a link to your website so people maybe could, could uh, link to that. Um, I think it's weekly. Is it weekly? I can't remember. It's weekly. Weekly, yeah. And invariably, I find something in that newsletter that is interesting, even if it's, even if it's a, a particular aspect of, of photography that I'm not necessarily uh, good at or, or have done. Or maybe not even interested in doing, but there's there's really uh it's a it's a good it's a good newsletter and it's, it's if you're inter interested in uh, um, just getting different perspectives, um, uh, Greg has just, got some. Just good email me the address you want it sent to. Yeah, you can or throw it in the club. chat if you you can throw it in the chat if you wouldn't mind. Is yeah, possible? or if you want, um, just have someone in your club send it out to whoever wants it or to everyone in the club. Some clubs okay. do that. Okay. So that being said, so um. Uh, Greg's also an accomplished judge for the Northern California Council of Camera Clubs, which is we're we're one of the fifteen to seventeen cup clubs that are in that in, in the uh, Northern California Council of Camera Camera Clubs. We compete against each other on a monthly basis with the uh, among ourselves and then among the clubs. And uh, um, Greg, we've had Greg as a, a judge several times. So uh, a person who has who has a lot of good experience, a lot of good um, uh, uh, information. Uh, to share with us. And uh, Greg, do you want to say anything else about your about yourself? I like photography. Um, my post, I've been posting a picture a day um, for about seven years straight. I think doing a 365 project, posting a picture a day is wonderful. Um, I don't believe in the rules for 365 projects. You need to set your own rules. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is um, years ago, someone complained that I oversaturate my pictures. I hadn't, but I made it a personal rule that I wouldn't use saturation or vibrance controls at all. So none of the pictures I use use saturation or vibrance. Um, that, and I often say in my pictures, no saturation or vibrance. If you look at my pictures I've been doing since I'm wheelchair bound for this year, at least, if you look at the pictures I've been doing this year, I can only get to the flowers by wheelchair. I can't get to any place else. Um, None of the pictures use in saturation or vibrance, um, and they're fairly colorful if you look at it. Uh, they're on Facebook and elsewhere. 
Um, I love doing astrophotography. I love doing creative, especially fantasy and science fiction. Uh, kind of doing hard doing astrophotography right now. Um, I love doing portraits. Um, I've taught classes on astrophotography, portrait photography, uh, the, how to photograph green flashes. We'll be talking about the night, how to photograph the moon, a lot of other stuff. Uh, one of the pages in this talk will be on some of the talks that I've given. Um, I'd like to point out that I will not be reading the slides very much. Um, I expect you to read them while I add color to the slide. Um, I hate PowerPoint. I expect most of you hate PowerPoint. And the reason I hate it is too many people read the slides. And I try and avoid that. I um, have a degree in physics. I've taught a lot of classes. Um, uh mostly evening hour classes uh nine years at uc santa cruz extension on various computer security security and wireless security classes a lot of photography classes a lot of classes of microprocessor for lockheed corporation like 30 over 30 different uh courses a uh, bunch of other stuff um if you have questions give me a shout Love to talk about photography. Love to talk about the philosophy of photography. I have a Facebook group called 365 um, Photographic Arts and Tech. And the idea is, is that a photographic art, sorry, forget the tech. We talk about the art side. We talk about the technical side. We don't do any reviews of any uh, cameras or anything. Don't mention different kinds of cameras except to say they're all the same. Um, just try and talk about what could make you a better photographer. And that's been going on for about three years. Okay, Greg, I'm going to share the screen with it. You have the screen now. Do you want people to ask questions during the presentation or do you want them to note them and then you'll discuss them at, later on, maybe halfway through or something? You need to give me permission to share, please. Okay, yeah, I'm going to give it to you right now. Uh, whichever way you want. People are welcome to discuss. How long do I have? I'll say an hour and a half again. Hour and a half? Okay, so let the questions roll. Just let sing out what you want. Okay. If someone's uh posting um questions, um let me know because I'm not gonna be looking at the question box. I be looking at my the slides. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna share this with you now. Okay, you're there. We see it. Am I full screen enough? Yes. Uh, yeah, yep. you're pretty, pretty, pretty big. We can see the screen. We can see the uh, uh, the dialogue uh, 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 sidebar on the left. Yeah, um, I, it's fine. It's fine though. It's it's not yeah. taking a lot of room. Yeah, this is PDF. I can't change it right now. No, it's fine. Okay, we're going to be talking about. There's a lot of different phenomena uh, at sunrise and sunset. Far more than most people are aware of. I've identified over a hundred different. Uh, items, we'll be going over about 60 of them. Um, unless I say otherwise, uh, all the pictures are ones I've made. So um, enjoy. These are some of the talks I've given um, for uh, camera clubs, the Milky Way photography, photographing the moon and the sunset, of course, are the most popular. Uh, one of my favorite ones I've only given a couple of times is photographic fraud. Um, there's a lot of interesting stories involving photographic fraud. Maybe you guys want me to give a talk on that sometime because I'd love to talk about that again. Uh, the economics of space travel is fun, but it um, doesn't really apply to photography very much, unfortunately. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of these. We've got a lot of photographs, including lots and lots of photographs of green flashes. I'll be going over them. I'll be giving you references to various apps, websites, books, tools that'll help you. Uh, not all the names are standard. I've made up some of the names. I tried to indicate it when I did and the reason why. I want to emphasize strongly again and again, do not look directly at the sun or photograph it unless you know what you're doing. I'll give you some hints as we go. If you photograph the sun or you look at it directly the wrong way, you can blow out your eye, you can blow out your camera, you can ruin your lens. I've literally burned 
a hole in the side of a telescope because I did it wrong when I was younger. Please be exceedingly careful in photographing the sun. You'll get in trouble, permanent. Uh, there's a bit of a difference between what you can see and what you're likely to see. If you want to see something that you don't see that often, you need to go out more often. Uh, when I was healthier, I'd go out five out of seven nights. I do include uh, three or four applications that will give you um, hints as to what the sky, what the sun is going to be doing that night. I don't use them anymore. I stopped years ago because you just need to go out. You need to stay out there until 20 or 30 minutes after the sunset because things happen and the predictive software just is often wrong. So it is easier to see things near the horizon than overhead. That's because your head does not design to look straight up. Um, for a similar reason, there's some really neat phenomena overhead that you don't notice because it's hard. Um, so rainbows are more easy to see than arcs and halos, but halos are actually more common. We'll look a lot at, uh, on halos later on. Where your location is on Earth makes a big difference. Um, there's some fun things like iridescent clouds or overhead. You can't often you can't always see them, but you can look at some water or oil on the ground and look up in the sky that way, and you may see the iridescent clouds uh, quite easily that way. Well, I want you to remember that what the camera sees is not what your eyes see. And what your eyes see is very different than what your brain sees. Camera shooting in raw mode are better at getting subtle details. And we're gonna be looking at some very subtle details. And I'll give you some hints on how to uh, post-process them so that you can bring them out like anti-crespular rays. Really cool, kind of easy to see with your eyes, uh, kind of hard to see uh, just with a simple camera unless you post process it and add a lot of contrast. So my favorite things to photograph are green flashes, sun dogs and light pillars. And we'll be going over them, including the physics, how to see them, where to see them, when to see them. There's a lot of other neat things and some sad things uh, which produce interesting photographs. Here's basically what we'll be talking about in order. The items in color are the, I'll be going over what phenomena you can see at these times of a sunset. I'm kind of excluding stuff that you do at night uh, from the astronomical side. I'm just including uh, the sunset related stuff that you see during astronomical twilight. Looking at the stars photographing the Milky Way and other stuff is a whole different ball game. And I have a talk on that if you want to hear it, but it's just really different than what we're doing here tonight. There's some real differences between sunset and sunrise. The colors are generally stronger in the evening because the wind, which comes from the uh, heat of the sun, typically, not all the time, but typically, kicks up more dust in the, for the sunsets. Um, if you don't have wind, the lakes and ocean are more mirror-like. If you don't have wind, it's easier to take longer exposures of flowers and trees and so on, unless you want in-camera motion. It's an old sailing, sailors take warning. Red skies at morning, sailors take warning. That's partly true. Red clouds towards the sun at dawn do not indicate that you're going to have a rain or a storm. Uh, bright red, dense alto cumulus and strato cumulus all over the sky, mm, rainstorms more likely. And if you have bright red clouds at the anti dawn side of the sky, uh, rain is even more likely. But overall, clouds at sunrise and sunset are not a good indication of uh, uh, there are better ways to do weather forecasting. Just an old sailor's tale. 
there's a bunch of clouds. Um, this is in the handout. You can pick up the handout when you want. I'm not going to go over it in detail because it's take too long. So the pre-sunset phenomena from zero to two hours, or I should say from minus two hours to zero before the sun hits sunset. You've got rainbows. You've got golden hour. You have uh, peridonia, which we'll talk about. Well, I have peridonias all the time. Halo, sun dogs, sun pillars, glories, cloud air distance, and vigorous. Actually, some of these you can see throughout the day. You just need to look for them. You need to be outside looking. The better your horizon, the more chance you have to see these things. And the more you can look up, the more chance you have to see some of the stuff. So I've got a lot of dense information on rainbows and some of the other stuff. Some of the stuff I want to talk about, well, we'll go over some more of it uh, when we actually look at pictures of rainbows. But the colors you can see in a rainbow kind of depends on your skill level. You guys being photographers are probably going to be able to see a lot more than five different colors. A really good color person might see a hundred or more colors. Depends on the skill of the observer. One problem people have with rainbows is that if the rainbow is big, your camera may not be able to see the whole rainbow. If the rainbow's at the maximum size, um, you're gonna need a 19 millimeter lens or wider on a full frame camera because the full circular diameter of the rainbow is 84 degrees. That's pretty wide. A glory is similar to a rainbow, we'll cover it more, but it's only five to 20 degrees wide. There are a lot of variations of rainbows. Why pictures of some of them? I regret that I do not have pictures of many more of them. Uh, Circumcum, horizontal and circular come zenith arcs. They're kind of similar. We'll look at some of them, but they are caused by ice crystals instead of water and they're dimmer than rainbows. So here is yay, typical rainbow. I took it from my back porch. I used a long telephoto lens because I wanted to isolate the rainbow and get rid of the houses in the way. How many colors can you see here? Yeah, you're looking through Zoom and Zoom kills things a bunch, but you should be able to see at least 10 colors without any problem or shades. We have a double rainbow here. There's some interesting things here. The secondary rainbow is dimmer. Almost every time you have a good primary rainbow, you have a secondary rainbow, but because it's dimmer, you may not notice it. There's a couple other things here that we haven't talked about yet. One is, is that the colors are inverted in the secondary rainbow. So red is facing red and blue is away and blue is away on both of them. If you had a triple rainbow, they'd flip colors again, but in between, the primary rainbow and the secondary rainbow, the sky is a little bit darker. This is called Alexander's Band. It's uh, darkest between the rainbows. I ought to make a rock song about it. It's always darker between the rainbows. You can have a rainbow in the surf. There are a lot of other kinds of rainbows. Uh, you may have heard about the moonbows during Yosemite waterfalls. Uh, Sky and telescopes often publish this guide to when to do it. Fog bows are common when you have fog near offshore. There's a lot of others. What I'd like to photograph most that I have it is a red bow, which is when you get a rainbow uh, in the fog at sunset, so you just have red. Remember, the rainbow is going to be opposite the sun and the rainbow is going to be at a maximum when the sun is lowest. So the rain, if the sun is high in the sky, the rainbow is going to be a lot smaller. So you can use a longer lens. The golden hour is typically considered when the sun is less than 12 degrees up from setting. Depending on the time of year, it's maybe an hour. The light's warmer. And if you look down there, you see your typical color temperatures. Midday is about 5,500K, golden hour is about 3,500K, and sunset's about 2,000K. So the last two hours, you're gonna go from 3,500K to 2,000K. Of course, you can change that in your camera. You can also change that in post real easy. 
golden hour picture sun it looks like it's about two or three diameters of the sun above the ocean and it's golden but you can also get this effect on skin and it kind of looks like an old master's painting that may be due to age from the oil paints and the old masters in this case i was playing games and post-processing paraphernalia is a psychological thing when your mind sees things that aren't there i'm seeing a bat hanging from the ceiling can you guys see that you can see the eyes and the mouth maybe the folded up wings yeah mm -hmm. It's real common. You can look at the bark of a tree. You can look at rocks. You can look at clouds. I keep seeing jet planes and dragons in clouds all the time. Here is a partial list of halos. I thought you'd get bored if I crammed more onto this page. The important ones I'll be talking more about are the 22 degree halo, which is caused by ice bending light 22 degrees. It's the most common the 46th degree, the light pillar, the periarch, I'll show you pictures of these, sun dogs, and a few others. The left and right hand columns are not alternate names. I'm just trying to cram more things onto the page. Halo, also called a nimbus, an ice bow, a glorielli. It's basically light interacting with ice crystals in the atmosphere. So the more ice crystals you have, the better the chance. But since the air is colder as you're higher up, you can do it even at the equator. Halos are often near the sun or the moon, but they can be a long ways apart. Some are pretty common, others are rare. The ice crystals ideally should be in cirrus or cirrus stratus cards about five to 10 kilometers up. If the weather's cold, they can float near the ground and sometimes the dust is referred to as diamond dust. You may see uh, light pillars need street light, near street lights if it's, you've got the ice crystals in the air. So here we have a picture in Half Moon Bay. You can see the sun off to the left and right at 22 degree angle. You see two bright spots. Those are sun dogs. If you look carefully, you can see a dim curve connecting the two sun dogs all at 22 degrees above the setting sun. Sun dogs, sometimes called sun dogs, sometimes called mock suns, phantom suns, um, perihelion. Um, it's bright spots on either side of the sun uh, that are 22 degrees because they are part of the 22 degree halo. Uh, there are a lot of different kinds of halos in the sky. This is one of the more common ones. Uh, they're not real bright. They're nowhere near as bright as or as colorful as a um, rainbow, but they do have color. I'll show you a close-up picture of one. You can see them any place in the world, any season, but they are dim. Most easily seen when the sun's closest to the horizon. I'll skip the sun dog physics. You can go over it in detail when you look at this. And I do have some references at the end. So here's a sun dog picture I took in Death Valley. You can see the red, the red, unlike the sun dog, is facing where the sun is. And you can see that it's dim, it's faded, it's very wide. But it's there. I don't think these colors are real pretty, but they're kind of interesting. Here we have a sun pillar. This one's kind of dim. Um, I said Pescadero, Pescadero Beach. Uh, facing the town of uh, Pescadero, one of my favorite places to photograph. Um, basically, a sun pillar, light pillar, whatever you want to call it, is a vertical pillar. Uh, we talked about earlier, it generally comes from hexagonal plates and column-shaped ice crystals. Um, 
they cause a pillar when the sun uh, could be as much as 20 degrees above or below the horizon. They also be from the moon, street lights, or other bright lights. Here's another uh, sun pillar with some other stuff going on. This is from Apun Bay. Uh, here's another one. Uh, you, you look carefully. I'm going to give you a minute to look at this carefully because there's a lot of things going on in this picture. The next picture will illustrate, uh, call out with labels, some of the stuff you see. So look carefully for a minute. See what you can see. Don't worry about the proper name unless you know it. Just try maybe make a sketch of what you're actually seeing. As I mentioned, these are subtle at times. Okay, this is not a final exam, so we'll move on. The bright column in the center is the actual sun pillar. Uh, over on the left, about the middle of the picture, just below, you've got a flock of birds. They're kind of black. Um, up above that, you have a 22 degree arc, which goes all the way from left to right. Above that, you have the upper tangent arc, which goes up to the left and right. The right side is brighter than the left side in this picture. And where they interact in the center is called the peri arc. So you look at the sky before. Hey, I see a sun pillar. Look carefully, and there's a whole bunch more stuff you can actually see. Take the picture, give yourself extra room, uh, work in post processing to try and bring out the details. It's not cheating. You're trying to do science, you're trying to get extract more data then the simple picture will actually show you. The circumhorizontal arc, uh, sometimes called the lower symmetric 46 degree plate. These names are getting long, aren't they? And boring. We'll have a table that you can look at more later. Um, it's twice as far as the 22 degree arc, well, a little bit more than that. Maybe the 22 degree arc is actually 22 and a half, who knows? Um, the red is uppermost color. Um, that often you only see fragments of the art. Sometimes you see it uh, with just colors, and that's called a fire rainbow. I've not seen that. I'd love to see that and photograph it. And they could be sun based, they could be moon based, they might be based on a bright light. People to seldom notice them because they don't look up. I'd like to point out that arcs are about two or three times as common as rainbows. People see rainbows more often because they're closer to the horizon and they have stronger colors, but there's a lot more in the sky than rainbows. A glory is a phenomena that's similar to an iconic saint's halo um, in the shadow above observer's head. It caused by sun or moon interacting with water drops and mist or clouds. So if you're standing on a hilltop and you're in the mist or top of uh, the fog near it, uh, the glory may be five or 20 to 20 degrees across. Um, it's a bunch of successively dimmer rings. Um, they're not circular rainbows in this case, rainbows are a lot larger. The Brock and Spear specter, something called the mountain specter is a magnified thing that you can see on the cloud below. You can also see this when you look at the shadow of an airplane in flight and the center of the shadow is bright. That's actually caused by a little bit different from optical phenomena. But if you're flying, uh, you might want to try and figure out if you can see the shadow of the airplane on a white cloud and look at it real carefully. Cloud iridescence is um, kind of subtle, but they can be sometimes really vivid. Uh, they're best found in clouds that are young, they have a lot of moisture in the clouds, but they're thin. Uh, in daytime, the sun's glare can mask it, but you can see it uh, perhaps by looking, hiding the sun behind a tree or building uh, using dark glasses, looking at reflections of the sun in a pool of water, something else like that. It's a diffraction phenomena called by small water or ice droplets. Larger ice crystals produce halos.
Oh, we've got some colors up here in this sun. These are young clouds just recently formed from fog. Lots of moisture in them. Uh, here's the moon. Yeah, I did a, poor, a very poor job of trying to bring the moon out, but the colors of the iridescence are real. Virgo is a fun stuff. You get really pretty things of uh, rain that falls down and then fails to reach the earth. They don't have to be water. They don't have to be ice. On Venus, there's sulfuric acid. On Mars, it's snow. It's thought to happen in Jupiter, Saturn, Titan, and other places. Here's some examples of uh, rain falling down, never reached the ground. Here's a prettier example. I'm sorry, I didn't get this picture of the white band at the bottom. It's just simply my Aaron aligning the photograph. But I think that the uh, clouds here are kind of pretty. Crestular rays are a lot of fun. They have a lot of different names, including backstays of the sun, Buddha rays, cloud breaks, Jacob's ladder, ropes of Maui, uh, sun drawing water, sunburst, uh, God's rays, finger of God, Jesus rays, devil's rays, Tyndall rays, just and more. This again, and I ran out of room. Uh, here's some of the backstays of the sun. This is real common and easy to see. But there's actually a couple of different phenomena that we're talking about with crustular rays. And we'll see another example when the sun's below the horizon. Uh, but we're we'll first going to talk about sunburst and starburst. It's an in camera or in eye event. Um, it's beams of light radiating out. Uh, it's often used in flags and ornaments. Here's a sunburst at Hickman Bridge in Capitol Reef uh, at dawn. This is in camera phenomena. You want a wide angle lens, you want a high F number. Like I think I used F16 here. Uh, the cloud colors at pre sunset are very, they're not as interesting. They get more interesting as you get closer and closer to the sun. But you can see some stuff here. See, yellow is due to pollutants, typically, it's typically smoke. Um, yellowish can be caused by nitrogen dioxide. Uh, which is high air pollution in some cities. As we get closer to the sun, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some various phenomena listed here. So I'm not going to talk much about it here. We have nice, pretty yellow colors near dawn. This is Mono Lake. Uh, we have two kinds of scattering that are interesting. Our uh, Raleigh scattering, Raleigh scattering uh, changes the color of the light. Me scattering changes the direction of the light without changing the color. So I'll show you some examples. Uh, Raleigh scattering removes the shorter wavelengths uh, because you have to go through more things. This makes lots of interesting stuff going on. And this is a picture of Pescadero. You've got some vivid color. Uh, this happened. 22 to minutes after sunset. What's interesting is, is that I stayed there even though the sky was boring, boring, boring. And then after 22 minutes, it popped out for a minute or so. Stay for about half an hour after sunset. Me scattering is uh, changing the light. It's due to a different uh, size, wavelength and droplets. Um, Without me scattering at sunrise and sunset, the horizon would only be sort of dullish red while the rest of the sky blue. So here's me scattering and a 22 degree halo. I blocked the sun with the roof of my house. Volcanoes can sometimes do things. Most of the time they don't. You need to get um, major volcanic, especially sulfur dioxide, we'll go into that more in a second, into the stratosphere or higher. The sulfur dioxide gets transmit, changed into sulfuric acid droplets, and that tends to create the vivid afterglows. So Krakatoa and Ma Pinabalu uh, did enough to cause major things. And the high altitude cloud tends to bounce sunlight up and down from the clouds to the ocean below and back up more so you get more scattering. However, 
we had the one of the strongest eruptions of all times. One of the most interesting one was in December and January, December of 2021 and uh, January of this year when the Honga Tonga, Honga Pape volcano exploded near uh, Tonga. This was, they're not really quite sure yet. They think it's more like VEI-5, but it might've been six. This dumped a lot of sulfuric acid into the stratosphere and the mesosphere. And that caused more, much more vivid sunsets, mostly in the Southern hemisphere, but some is leaking up to us. Um, it may last, this one's probably gonna last according to the experts. I'm not an expert in this, to at least the end of 2023. And it adds more colors, including purple. The first reference is the best on the sunset colors. And it shows among other things, uh, the purple is, these are all about four minute long, these sort of the four minute long videos. You can have forest fire sex effects at sunrise and sunset. Um, this is smoke and particles. They generally don't get the high. Um, they can make uh, mute colors, but they also make some things very colorful. It looks like a Japanese painting. So here's a picture my wife and I took at Myrtle Creek, Oregon in 2017. Um, I took this picture. My wife took a similar picture. Sad story. She turned it in for photojournalism, uh, for fire, forest fire effect. The judge didn't read what was going on or didn't know what was going on. Threw out saying this is fake. You use, used Photoshop to add saturation. Nope, no saturation added. This was really what was happening. The real sun was blocked so much. The trees were dark, even though the sun was many fists above the horizon and the sun had turned all red. It could get even more eerie. This was down at Morrow Harbor during the Thomas fire. The sun was even higher. The tall ship Lady Washington was there. And it makes me think of some eerie picture from the 1700s. And again, I wanna emphasize, I don't use saturation or vibrance controls. You got optical illusions from a bunch of different things. Um, but one thing that's important as the sun gets lower and lower in the sky, the time when the sun officially drops below the horizon, because the refraction bends the rays of the sun, the sun may appear to be still above the horizon at our latitude for maybe three or four minutes after it's actually sunk. As you go even further north, the sun can be appear to be below the horizon for a lot longer. The moon has a similar illusion. Here's a picture at Half Moon Bay at sunset during the fire season. This is from the campfire in 2018. I am so glad that even though California's had a lot of forest fires this year, we've only had about 20% of the forest fires that we've had in most of the prior years for the past decade. We're really lucky this year. Changing topic, I want to talk about something interesting that you probably haven't noticed. When the sun is like two to three diameters above the sun, sorry, two to three diameters of the sun above the horizon. If you take a photograph and look at it carefully, and I did add saturation here to bring out the fact that the top has a green rim, the bottom has a red rim. As you get lower, uh, this is going to become more amplified but I wanted to show it here when the sun's a bit higher. You do need to be careful when you're taking pictures at this time. It's safer when the sun is right on the horizon. At that point, the Earth's atmosphere is about 800 times denser than straight overhead. So when the sun's on the horizon, you can use a long telephoto lens and not burn out your camera or your eye. Nonetheless, I would not point out, I'd not point the camera at the sun any longer than you need to. Everyone see the green rim and the red rim? Yeah. So here I photoshopped it to split out most of the center of the sun to make it easier because I could magnify it to see the green rim and the red rim more. So rim optics. Um, as I said, this is a refractive phenomena. Uh, what's going on is several things. As you get closer to the horizon, 
Raleigh scattering scatters the short wavelengths more since the bottom of the sky and his sun is 31 arc minutes below where the top of the sun is, typically, depending on how what part of our orbit we're in, but it's close to 31 arc minutes. The bottom of the sun is going to have the green, blues, other things scattered away. So the top part of the sun, which is not scattered the greens and blues as much, it, we're going to see more greens and blues. Since the bottom of the sun is, since the top of the sun is also uh, getting a lot knocked out, the reds get knocked out more. Now, what about orange? That's between green and red. Well, there's a chemical in the Earth's atmosphere that uh, tends to absorb uh, the uh, orange color. I'll list that in a second. And you can go look it up if you have more detail. If you want to see these things without a camera, binoculars or telescope when the sun is low can be really helpful. But if you want to get a big, bright, beautiful green flash, you need a mirage to improve your color. So let's talk about mirages. These are optical phenomena caused by light rays. They're being bent by temperature. There are at least half a dozen kinds of mirages. These are real. That means they can be captured in a camera. They are not a hallucination. The human mind tries to make sense of an image. We talked about earlier, pareidolia. And uh, most of the mirages we're going to see are inferior, superior, and mock. There are a lot of different other kinds. There are a number of images that we can do. And we're going to be looking at these. You can look about these more later. But let's look at this in detail. Superior is because the real image is above the mock, the mirage image. I'll show you a picture. They're kind of rare near the sunset. Inferior is when the invented, inverted image, the uh, mirage image is below the real thing. The real thing in this case is the sun. And the mock mirage are little fingers coming out of the sun. There are optical modifications to these images. They can be normal, refracting, looming, sinking, towering, stooping. Uh, they can be inferior, superior. They can be late, three-stage, uh, mock, mock's common. Dr. Magana, we'll talk about that more. That's islands in the sky, ships that look like they're sailing the horizon when they're not there and so on. Here's a table of different kinds of mirages and whether or not they have green flashes or not associated with them. The superior is when warm air is above cold air. So you can figure out where the dividing line between hot air and cold is or cold air and hot. Uh, you can get a clue as to where things may be uh, interesting. And there's some examples at this URL. The URL is repeated at the end. I checked the URLs today. So we do not have a green flash here. We have a red flash because this is a superior mirage. Why is it a superior mirage? Because the real object, the sun, is above the miraged object, which is the red uh, flash below. We have a red flash and we have red mock mirages. The fingers sticking out to the side of the mirage image are the red mock mirages. The inferior mirage is when the real image is below the mirage image. That's what you typically see at sunset. The image is generally upside down. It is unstable because hot air rises. I'll show you an example coming up in a little bit. And they're typically no more than a degree across. So you've all seen uh, water on the highway as you go. They're really small. They don't last very long. Um, this is down near Taft, California. And you can see some water on the highway here. And it was a pain to photograph. I had to stop the car and hope nobody was coming behind me. Much easier to see in the car than photograph. So here we have some inferior mirage. It looks like a layer cake. 
and there's something up above. That's above is an inferior mirage. The sun is real, but you have little fingers sticking off to the side. Those are the mock mirages. Don't worry about the colors here. We'll see more color. Here we have an inferior mirage, a mock mirage, and then a heavy cloud, thin cloud layer, uh, physically thin, not optically thin. It's pretty thick optically. And the real sun down below it. Here we have a nice big mock mirage and no colors, just reddish. So the Fata Vagana is um, a superior image that could be really elaborate. It could change. Uh, I like the islands in the sky. It's really common in the Arctic, but I've people have seen it and photographed it from Half Moon Bay and the Golden Gate Bridge. So to spend the day looking at ships out at sea, maybe in a long lens. Um, I talked about what are the causes of the green flash earlier. Um, it's uh, the Raleigh scattering helps uh, determine the color. So blue flashes are more common uh, when you get a flash above a cloud or when you're high in the sky. We'll see some blue flashes. They're far rarer, 100 times rarer, maybe more rare than green flashes. Blue flashes happen when you can, the sun gets blocked higher in the air when the air is thinner. So we have multiple inversion layers here. You can see we have a complex green flash, not that colorful, but you can see the bright sun below it that's flown out. You can see in the green flash, you can see some purple, you can see some blue if you look carefully. I've blown this up. You can see the inferior mirage green flash down at the bottom is a kind of good one. You can see the mock mirage and up above. I blew part of that up so you could see it in detail uh, that the mock mirage's fingers stick out the side and it can have a lot of green. You will bring the green out with careful post-processing. Um, as I said, I do not use saturation and vibrance, but you can still bring it out with careful post-processing. So here are the different ones that are common. Uh, the Imperial Mirage, uh, if you have a sunset where it's going to happen, 90% of the time you can see inferior. Uh, 20 to 30, 40% of the time you can see mock mirages. You can see both at the same time. About 1% of the time or less, you can see subduct or green ray or a few others. They're very rare. So if you see them, uh, take a lot of pictures, worry about later. And here's what I'm uh, talking about. I've seen a photograph blue and violet. I showed you some already cloud top. Uh, the Alistair Fraser is a variant of the Mark Mirage, and so on. Uh, we're going to see a picture where it goes. Uh, this is our detail in this picture. So this is about two seconds. Uh, on the top, on the right, is equal time intervals over two second period, showing relatively high up. Uh, and how wide the uh, green flash was. And uh, the picture in the center shows the sun. Um, I'm sorry, not two seconds. This is over uh, about a minute or so. You can see some rather fuzzy uh, sunspots on the sun. You may be able to see some shadows of birds. But I'm just trying to show that over a period of time when the sun's setting, you can see all these changes. Any questions at this point? No. Let's move on. This is stupid. Consider me really stupid. I used a 400 millimeter lens. I was up at Fremont Peak. I'd forgotten that there was a partial eclipse of the sun. So I took a quick picture of the sun without a filter without a filter designed for photographing the sun. Uh, you'll notice I got some pretty nice sunspots. I also took the chance of burning up my lens, burning up my camera and burning up my eye. The way I did it was focus, set preset the focus, set the um, shutter speed and f-stop all that as high as I could. 
and then swept over the sun really quickly so it wouldn't have much time to do it. I strongly suggest you don't do this. You can buy a kit to build a very high quality solar filter from Bader Museum, B-A-A-D-E-R, something like that. It's a German planetarium. I believe you can buy it through Amazon and they make high quality stuff that will protect your eye and your gear. Here's a complex green flash caused by the moving air distorting things all over the place. Something a little bit more stable, but kind of upside down in places. Another green flash and another one lower to the horizon. So we're getting the green and the yellow from the sun. The Chappis band has sapped out most of the orange. Another green flash, overexposed, unfortunately. Uh, your exposure is going to change. You're going to have to let it more and more light as you get closer, closer to full sunset. I went too fast this time. A beautiful green flash, lots of complexity, lots of beautiful color. Uh, this was done with either a 400 or 600 millimeter lens, I forget which. It was a 600 millimeter lens. It was a Sony RX10 Mark III or Mark IV, which is a wonderful camera for just moving around because it's a lightweight camera with a 24 to 600 millimeter Zeiss lens. Yeah, it doesn't work that well in the middle of the night when you're doing uh, comets, but for sunsets, it's pretty damn good. Then I digitally blew this up a lot because you can see the curve of the sun, but it's not that much. And here we have multiple green flashes and multiple things because there's a bunch of inferior mirages throwing the greens and yellow from the sun all over the place. Question, did, did you see this with your eye? Were you aware you were taking this with when you took the picture? Did you see it with your eye? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, I generally don't set the camera into high speed, you know, 10 to 20 frames a second. The Arc Skin 10 can do 24 frames a second. The Sony A1 could do 30 frames a second. Because eventually the buffer is going to say, no, you don't, and it's going to make you wait, and the best things are going to happen. So I push my finger down. I keep it on a tripod generally. I push my finger down when there's something interesting that's changed. So I may end up taking 50 to 100 pictures over a two minute period and hope that I don't fill up, fill up the buffer. Go back to the house, figure out what's good. Uh, here we have a blue flash. Um, it's also called a cloud top flash or that Angus Brazier, whatever it was. You can see a blue uh, stuff to over quite a bit of the sun here. Why do we see blue? Because it's an optically dense cloud that blocked the sun. So the blue had not been killed by going through the atmosphere yet. Here we have another mixture of green and blue above the clouds. And some yellow. Here we have some more blue uh, with rather bright. So the blue is kind of dimmed on there. When you get your own copy, you can uh, digitally magnify it more and see the blue here easier. I thought it was a pretty picture. Uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. It's a rainbow. No, it's not. It's a complex green flash, blue flash on a cloud top. You see the cloud is getting a bit turbulent. It's kind of fun. Green flashes are simple. You got diffraction of light that scatters and leaves the green and blue lights higher and the red light doesn't show up as much what's higher because it's being blocked. You mostly have Raleigh scattering and some aerosolic scattering. Uh, you have the extinct of light, uh, the uh, chapis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Molecular uh, band uh, blocks a lot of the orange light. So the green becomes stronger. Um, you have intensification of the light by Mirage Lensing and Rohan um, at 
Uh, San Diego State University has some good pages. They're all on the last page of the, my references page at the end. I, as I said, I checked them today. Um, as near uh, White Mountain photographing uh, Mount White Mountain from Tams, Mount Tams overlook on Highway 395, and this came up. I have absolutely no idea why I got so many different colors. That boggles my mind. I don't know what was going on. But again, you see this when you're out a lot and you try a lot. Green flashes of any color are not fully understood, but they're real. You can photograph them. I've got thousands and thousands of pictures of green flashes. So, crespular rays sticking off from here. This is the better kind of crespular rays. You can see here, the sun is set. These are subtle phenomena. Um, you can see dozens of them stretching across the sky. Um, you can see that they all point back to where the setting sun is. Everyone see it, look closely, because turn around. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. We're now dealing with the sun from zero to six degrees below the horizon. We've got pink time, red time, often glow, the belt of Venus, otherwise known as the anti-twilight arc, uh, the shadow of the Earth, anti-solar point, and anti-crespular rays, among other things. We've got different cloud colors because the sun's low. The colors are different. Um, and I call, sometimes I call this the pink time. That's not an official um, name, but, you know, the sky does get pink. This is at dawn. And you can see a dark band below the pink. This is uh, a Polar Point uh, radio station, the big dome there. The dark band below the pink is cool because that's the shadow of our Earth. Uh, the sun's a few degrees below the horizon. So the shadow of our Earth is a few degrees up. Any questions? And you get the red time. Again, not an official time, but boy, can you get some red on the ocean water or any water. And you can get some beautiful orange clouds. And you can still have when the sun's still up. This is from Fremont Peak. So we've got two different things here, Alpen Glow and the Belt of Venus. Uh, up and glow is indirect sunlight. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Dan Bailey has an argument here that you go go read, saying that it's just uh, having uh, the sun on top of the mountain still appearing a bunch, even though the sun's not there when you're low. Uh, the belt of Venus is similar to up and glow, but it's actually backscattering of uh, red and sunlight, and it lasts a lot longer than the sunlight, and it's most vivid right after sunset. Here's an example of Mount of Alvin Glow on Mount Tam. And I think that, you know, there's real sunlight on the mountain in this picture, but it's still reddish from Alvin Glow. You can see the pink band of the belt of Venus here. And below that, you can see the dark band. That's not fog, that's the shadow of the earth. And now looking away from the sun, look carefully here. We've got the anti-solar point is where the anti-crespular rays are combining. They're in the belt of Venus and just below the anti-solar point, you have the shadow of the earth, which is rising because this is sunset. When the shadow of the earth has gotten all the way up, we have a fully dark sky. Now, it's really hard now to see the anti-crespular rays. And you noted, remember earlier, we had the crespular rays sticking away from the sun, going out in all directions and straight lines. Well, they weren't straight lines. They're curved as it went over your head. They curved all the way around your horizon and recombined at the anti-solar point. They started with the sun, they end at the point away from the sun. Here I worked on this a lot to make the anti-crespular rays. This is done from Dunes Beach in Halfland Bay where there's good horizon before the ranger kicked me out. 
Um, you can see the anti-crest pillar rays converging at the anti-solar point. The belt of Venus is easily seen in, on top of the anti-crest pillar rays where the clouds are. And then you can see the Earth's shadow and where they all converge. As you get lower from six to 12 degrees below the horizon, this is virtually called nautical twilight. You have afterglow, you can have sunset clouds, you can have the first stars. This is the famous mittens in Monument Valley. And then as the sun gets lower, you can have some stars in the picture. And when the sun is uh, 12 or more degrees down, this is straight down. So if you're in summer or you're further north, it takes longer to get 12 degrees down. Um, you can see stars, you can see lunar halo, lunar rainbows, moon bows, white bows. You might see earthquake lights, look it up. There's some space weather phenomena, auroras, air glow, zodiac light, we'll talk about that in the Gegenschein, I'll maybe talk about that. So we have a beautiful picture here of the Milky, the winter Milky Way, the belt of Orion, the belt of Orion, um, a lot of other stuff in the glow of Death Valley, I'm sorry, from Death Valley, the glow of Las Vegas about 150 miles away. Here we have the um, Milky Way at the entrance to Pinnacles National Park. There's some clouds in the sky, which I thought wrecked my picture of the Milky Way, but then I thought, ah, this is gonna be a different kind of picture. It's kind of fun seeing the clouds in the sky. Picture's long enough so that the trees and the fields became much stronger. You can get a lunar halo. I needed to pump ISO up quite a bit to get it so you can see noise. You can, this is from, um, I forget where it is. Is it valley that has really good flowers once in a while, but most of the time it's just dusty desert near Taft. Um, at any rate, you can see the, um, Pleiades in the center near the top. You can see the head of the Taurus the bull in the upper right. But down below at about a 20 degree angle from the rising going up to just to the left of the Pleiades, there is a broad fan of light. This is a zodiac light. Um, this I find super interesting. You know that the sun is out there and provides all the light for the solar system, the visual band. In the infrared, Jupiter pumps out a lot more light than it receives, but we're talking about visual light. As you um, look at the planets, the planets are all in alignment um, and they reflect light from the sun. You get smaller in size and you get the meteors and comets and asteroids, and they reflect light from the sun. You get smaller than the asteroids and meteors, you get really small and you have the dust. And it's normally really hard to see the dust. I'm sorry, I messed that up. I just spilled something on my desk trying to clean it up. Um, really small things. And that's the dust in the solar system you're looking at. It's the plane of the solar system and spread out a little bit. And you're just seeing dust right now, reflecting sunlight. I mentioned the Guggenheim, I'm sorry, the Guggenheim, that is at the anti-solar point. And it's where a little bit of light from the sun bends all the way around the earth and recombines with dust, very dim patch, exactly opposite where the sun is, most easily, easily seen maybe around midnight straight overhead. But this is a zodiacal light. You can best see it around March 21st at sunset and around September 21st at dawn. Why that time? Why do you not see 
it at sunset on the spring because you have uh and why do you not see it at dawn in the spring in uh march because the milky way is rising then and the milky way is a lot brighter than the zodiacal light in a similar thing on september 21st if you try and do the sunset zodiacal light the setting milky way is going to interfere with you so you're going to need to be careful so september 21st try dawn march 21st time region try sunset have a good dark horizon. This is faint. This is one of the faintest things you're going to photograph with a normal camera. So what we can see, all the phenomena come from sunlight or the lack of. We have refraction, reflection, scattering. This in turn can lead to halos, rainbows, sun dogs, ha uh, halos, much more. It can lead to mirages, to green flashes, and more. Lots of fun stuff, all due to sunlight. What happens to sunlight? Photography notes. The best advice I can give you is to go out and go out there a lot. The eye will sometimes see phenomena first. Sometimes the camera can't see it. The eye can often see more than a simple picture. HDR is sometimes needed to kind of equal the eye. You need to look all around, not just where you think the interesting phenomenon is, but turn around, look to the side, look behind you look to this up and down the stuff is different in fact you can make us photographers uh play games with you i was at bryce and uh the photographers at dawn were all focused on the hoodoos the people who are being bussed in were listening to the guy who's saying look at the sun all the pretty colors so they're all looking in opposite directions i noticed something that was going on in another direction. And I told the half dozen people who were with me, look over there, there's this thing. And all the photographers turned to where I was going. They said, there's another thing over this thing. And all the photographers turned and ran to the other side of the path to photograph. I was like, you can make photographers follow you like a herd of sheep. Sometimes the phenomena will only last a few seconds. Sometimes it'll last for minutes or hours. It can make a big difference. Careful post-processing is a huge help for this. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff up there that we don't know. It's not been seen. It may not have been photographed yet. Um, go out and photograph. Again, be really careful when you're photographing the sun and the sun's more than one sun thing above the horizon. If you do it, otherwise it can be trouble. Uh, be careful on cliff edges at night in strange areas. Um, if you're going out place you don't know, I recommend you take two flashlights. I was photographing something on a Santa Cruz beach, and I was walking back on the cliff edge of my flashlight, physically broken too. And I had to walk a few hundred yards on a cliff edge with no light at all. When I got back to my car and I could turn on a light, I could see, yes, the light I had physically broken due, due to age or something. But that was scary. Bring spare gear at night. Be real careful at night. There's a bunch of places where you can get prediction software. Um, I've given up on them. Uh, Sunset WX is free. Skyfire is like $30 a year. Um, it's a bit better, maybe. Uh, SK is about $30 a month. They claim to be a lot better. Uh, but um, just go out and do things. That's your best bet. TPE, the photographer's ephemeris, is really useful. Uh, the photographer's transit is even better, but it's more difficult to use. Command and compass spyglass, these for iOS. Um, Android probably is something similar, but I don't have an Android to check it out. Um, I like to use for uh, graphic depth of field, light and depth uh, application. I was using LensLab, but it's not been updated in a while, and the very high density um, sensors of today. We have 50 or more megapixels. Uh, Lens Lab, which is really pretty user interface, doesn't work as well. Tilt calculator is good for tilt shift lens computing. TPE, all of you should have TPE. Uh, you should have something so you can do releases in the field. And if you want to go for um, a lightning uh, hotspot finder, 
on the web will tell you where lightning's happening. Uh, darksky.net is unfortunately disappearing because Apple bought it. Ooh, Apple, in this case, I like Apple. Um, I use my rad radar to get good display of what's going on. Weather, PWS is personal weather station data. Um, half a day, depending on the season, has a half a dozen to several dozen different PWS stations are up and running, so that could give you an idea of how the weather differs where you are. Uh, Magic Seaweed is a great, great application for figuring out what waves are for photography. It's written for surfers, but it'll work for photographers. Tidegraph or Tidegraph Pro, the free version works pretty good. Uh, tell you what tides are going to be. Um, as I said earlier, Magic Seaweed tells you how much the waves are. And Strike Finder helps you figure out where lightning is. It's on the handout. You can write it down from there. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting books. Uh, the best one I found is Lights in the Sky. I strongly recommend Science from Your Airplane Window. It does not cover the material we're talking about uh, so much today, but it gives you a whole bunch of science things you can do in your airplane window from Google. Uh, to the glory when you look down at the shadow of the airplane on clouds to a lot more. It's a really fun book to read while you're in an airplane. Try and get a window seat. Some good Wikipedia articles out there. Um, there's a whole bunch of articles here on different stuff relating to whips to green flashes. Safety, safety, safety. You can burn out your camera, you can burn out your eye, you can burn out your lens. I burned out a telescope uh, body, 10-inch telescope, and I burned the edge of it. Uh, you can use pretty much any camera for this. Um, your exposure at sunset is going to change a lot. Um, I use HDR, uh, not to get HDR, but simply you get different exposures because I may not be getting it right. Uh, there's a bunch of things that are easy to see at sunset if you open your eyes or other things that are rarer. Uh, there's some common problems when you're doing photography. Um, if you have uh, reflections of the sun in your camera, you know, green, red, or other things, center your picture on the sun, crop it later. But if you center on the sun, all those nuisance little uh, things are going to recombine in the sun and they'll be lost in the brightness of the sun. A real common problem that drives me buggy is when horizons are not level when you're doing sunset pictures. Uh, the camera may shake as you get darker, so use a tripod. Uh, focus is a problem. You may want to go to manual focus and just keep it there. Um, suns, green flashes are easier over an ocean, but you don't have to be over an ocean. If you can get a horizon that's several miles away, like a mountain range, a hill range, that can be good. Blue and violets are generally most common at a high elevation. Um, I photographed them nicely at 10,000 foot when I was on uh, Santa Fe Mountain, when I was uh, taking a, a class at Santa Fe Photographic Workshops, or with dense clouds near to sea level. If people talk to you, can they distract you at the critical times? You bet, I've lost green flashes due to people asking me questions. For more interesting pictures, try adding good foregrounds people, wave reflections, crystal balls, and so on. Uh, try experiments with long exposures. Try experiments with composites. Um, try experiments with uh, water, off water during the sunsets. The colors may be stronger. Try very low clouds at sunsets. You have a lot of flat sand. It could be interesting. Uh, Thomas Hogan is a writer today I respect a lot. He's one of the two people I respect most in photography, technical stuff. Well, one of the two. I've, other people are going to be irritated if I say one of the top two. But Galen Rowell said to Tom once, we can't waste a sunset. We only have a finite number of them. So go out and photograph sunsets. Just go every time you can. It may seem like nothing's going to happen, but you could be wrong. And if you're not out there, you're certainly going to miss it. Any questions? No. Okay, this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube when people figure it out. And when I get 
uh, the right uh, information all in a uh, place to where you guys can uh, get a copy of this presentation. The URLs are in here. There's a lot of data in here I did not talk about uh, because um, I didn't want to go into too much detail. So we're done. Okay. Thank you. Sure learns that I don't know much. Yeah. Wow. Hey, this is wonderful stuff. You can study it. This is the thing where the more you study, the more you learn, the more you'll see. The eye, the camera, the brain all could need to combine to get the best stuff. It's good. Yes, thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Greg. We appreciate it. Uh, another great presentation. Uh, thanks for all that, all the work you obviously put into this. I love it. This is the labor of love. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can tell. Yes, it shows, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that's it for tonight, folks. Um, there will be, uh, once the recording gets uh, um, posted to the, uh, uh, to our, uh, actually, where do we push that? Is it, we post it to the, to the website or to our YouTube channel? YouTube, please. YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. Well, Stephen does that, so I'll, I'll, wait, I'll wait till he comes back. Yeah, when he gets back. Get, uh, um, uh, Greg, you could probably send your, you could probably send your uh, uh, presentation to uh, Stephen and me. And okay. We'll make, sure, we'll make sure it gets posted uh, somewhere near or alongside the uh, the video. The YouTube okay. Video. Okay. Sure. Thank you so much again. Thanks, everyone. You're oh, welcome. By the way, before we leave, um, I put a I put a link to Greg's uh, Slick Pick site in the chat. So if you haven't seen that, now's a good time to go there and click on that, and you can you can see some some uh, uh, you know he's got a broad spectrum of work that. Uh, that he uh, uh, types types of photography he does he does not just the uh, astrophotography but other types of photography too, so uh, check that out and uh, have a good night. Take care, folks. Thanks, Mark. Thank, Very much. Right. thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you.